Hello everybody and welcome back to The Second Shelf and to this week's Friday Reads in which I discuss the books that I've finished, am reading, started, I don't know, all the books. <laughs> but let's let's begin with the books that I finished last week. And the first one was a work of translated fiction, uh, My First and Only Love by Sahar Khalife, uh, translated from the Arabic by Aida Bamiya. The original uh, Arabic was published in 2010, and this is an English new release uh, of this year, um, 2021, I think in March. Um, and it's published by a publisher. I will leave a link down below if you're interested in Middle Eastern translated uh, works. Uh, they specialize in it. Uh, who fiction uh, and they have a really uh, uh, fantastic catalog I left a link uh, to, to the uh, publisher last time but didn't mention it in the video so you might have missed it anyway this was a buddy read uh, with Joe Smith um, and the buddy read was an absolute delight but the book did not 100% work for me um, we follow uh, two timelines. Uh, the first one is in the now, which was the 2008-2009. book was published 2010. Um, and when an older woman, Nidal, in her 60s, maybe even a little older, comes back to her uh, home in the West Bank after being uh, uh, an artist, a renowned artist, and living abroad for many, many decades. And there she uh, remembers her first love, Raby, uh, just before um, the partition decision of the UN, so in 1948. And so we, we go back and forth in these two uh, timelines. Um, we learn about Raby and uh, Nidal encounters Raby again when she is back now as an older woman. Um, and... Th that was, I, I felt, uh, sort of, th that interested me, that the idea of leaving your home and then coming back and maybe, uh, you know, re-meeting people that you haven't met uh, for a long time, especially somebody you've been in love when you were 14 or 15. But this last third of the book um, is um, the, the diary of uh, Nidal's uncle during the fight in 1947. And that break didn't work for me. The language didn't quite work for me, whether possibly the translation, I don't know. It felt really stilted. Um, I didn't, I, I couldn't really get into the book. Um, the language was sort of a barrier for me, but also the the combination of these war stories that took quite a, a, a long a, a big portion of the book it it just the combination of it all didn't work for me i mean it was of course it is a topical book and i would still recommend it and i would want to read more of this author she's a palestinian author uh, you know, born in the West Bank um, in 1942. So I'm interested in more of her work. And certainly at when we read this, um, the so-called escalation uh, escalated even more uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the Middle East. So it's interesting, but it just didn't, as a, as a work of fiction, it just didn't do it for me, uh, unfortunately. The next book I finished was a non-fiction work that I read for Springathon. You are probably familiar with this readathon, um, the first two weeks of May. So it's still ongoing until I think today, but I'm just reading a little bit. Uh, I mean, I'm just extending it a little bit, at least uh, over the weekend. But you know, uh, but anyway, the Springathon is a readathon organized uh, uh, to encourage us to read a nature writing. Um, and I will leave a link to my TBR video down below and there you can find all the information um, and just hop on hop on the train now. I mean, you can extend the readathon 
as long as you want. But anyway, so one of the books that I read for Springathon was finally, finally this one, The Orchid Thief by Susan uh, Orlean, which was published more than 20 years ago. Um, and I was delighted to see in the comment section when I mentioned it uh, last Friday reads that other people, I'm not the only one who hasn't read it yet. <laughs> anyway, Susan Orle Orlean is um, um, a, a, a journalist of long form, you know, essayistic uh, journalism. And this was first published, uh, not not the whole book, but uh, a piece of it was published um, in Vanity Fair. And then she made uh, a whole book out of it. And we follow uh, one particular orchid thief, uh, John LaRoche, who is, um, yeah, a peculiar guy to say the least. But um, his uh, attempt to to steal certain orchids from a reservation in Florida, um, but also his life, uh, how he got involved in the whole orchid trade. And then um, uh, Orlean also tells us something about you know, where this fascination with orchids came from when they were first in Europe or in the US and you know, so we learn also something about the history of the orchid uh, while we follow uh, John LaRoche. Um, I thought it was fascinating. It's really well written. You know, it flows. You can read it easily. And orchid people are really weird. <laughs> That's fascinating to read about. So I, I absolutely enjoyed it. I'm glad I finally read it. And if you're one of those people like me uh, who haven't read it yet, I can certainly recommend it. Whether you're interested in orchids, I mean, I'm not an orchid fan at all, but I find this idea that how we are obsessed, how some people are obsessed with a certain flower and the trade around it, you know, the orchid trade and the uh, the, the growing of orchids. Um, yeah, it, it, it's just fascinating and certainly um, because it's the way it is written. So I can highly recommend this one. I also finished uh, a couple of more books, uh, two to be precise, um, shortlisted books, women's prize shortlisted books, trying to make all sentence here. Uh, but as I told you before, I'm not going to include those in my Friday reads uh, because I want to make separate videos, uh, review videos of, for each six of the books. Uh, once I've read them all, I will probably start um, in end of May, beginning of June, because the winner of the women's prize will be announced on the 7th of July. And I want to get the reviews up before that. But Anyway, I want to mention it. I finished two more. Um, and then I want to talk about uh, a book that I'm currently reading and have been reading for quite a while, um, but haven't mentioned uh, so far, I think. And that book um, is a collection of texts, uh, stories, but also nonfiction texts called The New Daughters of Africa, um, collected by Margaret Busby. Um, this was a present, um, birthday present last year uh, from Mel, from Mel's Bookland Adventure, and we are reading it together. Whoops. And we started, I think, in February, because it is more than a thousand pages. No, I'm exaggerating, 800 pages. Uh, but anyway, um, Margaret Busby uh, is, um, was born in Ghana, but educated in uh, in Britain and she was the first black woman um, founding a publishing house and she uh, works as an editor and this is the second one um, a collection of African female voices or descending from Africa so there are also uh, uh, women included who live uh, in, I don't know, England or the US or somewhere else, but were born in Africa. Um, and it starts in the 19, pre-1900 uh, uh, from birth date. It's organized by birth date of authors. So it starts with the pre-1900s and, and then it goes all the way up to uh, women born in the 1990s. Uh, and it's absolutely fascinating. Um, uh, not all the texts are wonderful and the texts are pretty short. So it's mostly three, four, five pages. Some of the texts are short stories written specifically for this collection or a nonfiction piece specifically written for this collection. But it's also excerpts of novels or excerpts of a speech or a nonfiction book. So it's, it varies. But what it really teaches you is to me, at least, 
me, what it teaches me, uh, it's heavy, so it's falling over, uh, is how many, many, many interesting female voices are out there, African female voices, I have never heard of. Uh, so it's it's uh, fascinating. We will, we are almost done. We have about, as you can see, we have about a hundred, can you see that? Yeah, about 150 pages to go and we will finish um, next week. Uh, but I at least wanted to mention this, that we are we have been working our way through this 800-page uh, collection uh, for February, March, April, yeah, four months, and it's absolutely worth it. So if you've never um, encountered that, and if you're interested in reading uh, pieces by African women, yes, it's on script, by the way, uh, so if you don't want to, you know, commit to buying it right away you can have a look uh, uh on script and all there is also a, a short biography of the author before the text starts so you also learn about where the author was born uh, what she does whether she's a writer or whether she's an activist or whether she's a lawyer or whatever what have you um so yeah i thought this was really really interesting and um to, to find out more about Daughters of Africa. And then I have two more books uh, to talk to you about, um, both of which I started last week. And the first one I will also finish <laughs> this week because it's a very short uh, novella, 120 pages, and that is Ursula Le Guin's The Word for World is Forest, first published in 1972. Ursula Le Guin, of course, the grand dame of sci-fi. And you might remember that I'm reading Ursula Le Guin's Hainish Cycle um, in chronological publication order together with Adam from Memento Mori. And this is our, I think it's our fifth uh, book. Um, and they are all set in the same universe, but they are standalone uh, books story-wise. So you don't need to read the previous books in order to read this one. Uh, this one is set um, on a world where you have mainly forest and people, very peaceful people living there, but then they are uh, uh, conquered and colonized uh, by uh, uh, people from Earth because people from Earth need um, the, the wood, the timber, um, and battle ensues, of course, after, you know, the colonization. And it's like I said, short but very packed and very dense and we get the story from various perspectives one of which um, is one of the military uh, leaders of the people from earth Davidson but also somebody from the original indigenous population and an anthropologist who came with the people from earth but is not part of the military you know not part of the army it's pretty horrific um, and the first thing you think about when you when the book opens with this army guy talking in a in a condescending way um, um, about the population, but also recounting you know the violence um, that they uh, inflicted on the population with pride. I have to say he talks about it with pride. The first thing you think is um, you know Vietnam apocalypse now something like that and. Indeed, Ursula Le Guin wrote this book, um, you know, in this uh, 1960s, 1970, early 1970s, thinking about Vietnam, obviously. But so far, it's really, really good. The world building is fantastic. The characters, um, and she can just, you know, she has um, the, the, her craft is so uh, brilliant um, that she can pack information into this little novella without ever info dumping. So I'm really looking forward to talking to Adam about um, the rest of the book. We read half uh, beginning of the week and we will read uh, the rest uh, today. And the other book um, uh, that I started this week is a non-fiction work that I've also picked for um, uh, Springathon and for the prompt buzz stillness. And I picked something about the universe. And that is Katie Mack's book, The End of Everything, Astrophysically Speaking, which was published last year. Um, Katie Mack is an astrophysicist, um, an astronomer. And in this book, she talks about the various ways that our universe might come 
to an end. Whether it's the big crunch, um, you know, that the universe expanding now, but then falling um, falling in itself together again, uh, or whether it's the big rip, so the universe just, you know, ripping apart, or whether you have uh, some other possibilities. I mean, it sounds gloomy, I know, um, but it isn't. Um, at least not if you're interested in this kind of, you know, astronomy, astrophysics. Uh, Katie Mack has a way of explaining um, the, these possible endings of our universe in a way that are not gloomy. Yeah, I, I can't really explain why. Maybe because all of the possibilities are many, 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 many billion years ago uh, in the future. So we will probably not see any of it. But also the way she talks about it, it's not all gloom and doom. And I'm, you know, I'm a, a nerd about the universe. I love to read about the universe. So I find this book uh, fascinating. I'm about halfway through now and I will probably finish uh, next week, I guess. But if you're interested in this topic, in astronomy, um, uh, you will find this book engaging. You don't need any maths. She explains really well. You do need a little bit of an inclination to, you know, uh, deal with, um, yeah, if she, if she mentions general relativity and explains this theory, you shouldn't have your eyes glaze over because you're not interested. Then this book is not for you. But if you are interested in learning something without needing you know, uh, uh, higher mathematics or physics at all, because again, she explains really well, then this book might be for you just as it is for me. Anyway, these are the books that I want to talk about in this week's Friday Reads. Uh, thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, I hope you had a great week of reading. Talk to me in the comments as always, uh, and I'll see you all soon in the next one. That's what I always say. I see you all soon in the next one.